Good evening. Would you all stand with us tonight? Welcome, and uh, thank you for being with us at our Good Friday service tonight. And we just pray that this would be a time of just reflection for you, um, and that you, we can truly just remember what Jesus has done for us tonight. Uh, so thank you for being here, and let's, let's all just uh, remember what Jesus has done tonight. Thank you. 
Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Well, amen. Uh, as I said earlier, thank you for being uh, with us at our Good Friday service. And uh, this is a time of reflection. And oftentimes at Good Friday, we, we reflect upon the sacrifice that Jesus has made for us. And um, also, I think along with that, we want to reflect on just the humanity of Jesus as well. We know that Jesus was 100% man, but 100% God as well. And uh, so at this time, we, we want to reflect on that as well. And the, re the point of this reflection, um, and I know it is a somber thing, but it's, it's not just to be somber, not just to be sad, but uh, it's to realize what Jesus did, he did for our benefit. And that's, I love that passage of scripture. And in that passage of scripture, it calls him a man of sorrows. Jesus, it describes him as a man of sorrows. And so what he did, he did for our benefit. Um, and it kind of brings for me the question up to my mind, what, what should our response be to that? And as I was thinking about this, that this week, I just thought, you know, it's just thankfulness. That's, I think that's our response to what Jesus has done. It's just thankfulness. Um, and the reason why is because Jesus became a man so that we could have access to God. Jesus had access to God, and we know, as the scripture says, that he became obedient even to the point of death, and he took on the form of a servant, and uh, so he became a man so that we could have access to God, and that's why we are thankful. Jesus bore our sin so that we could have freedom, and he bore our sorrow so that we could experience joy, and he bore our griefs so that we could be comforted. And so it's this great exchange that Jesus accomplished for us. And that's one of the things that we see uh, in talking about Jesus being a man of sorrows. And in addition to that, we also see that Jesus is approachable for us. He's approachable both legally and relationally. Uh, and what that means is we approach him on the basis of what his, sin, uh, what his blood has done with our sin. He's he has washed away our sin, and that gives us the ability legally to approach him. But also, he is also relationally able to be approached by us, meaning this, um, that he understands what we go through. He understands the things that we deal with. And whenever we approach him, we should approach him with that in mind, in that, in that light, that Jesus, he understands where we're at, and that he, that, that he can relate uh, because he was a man of sorrows. I want to read a scripture to you. And after that scripture, we're going to sing the next song. But I just want to read this scripture and then we're just going to kind of let that sit and just have you think about that. It's out of the book of Hebrews. It says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, Let's approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace for help in the time of our need.
that you have made. Lord, we just honor that sacrifice tonight, God. We thank you that you have took, taken the wrath of God upon yourself in our place, Jesus. We're so grateful. Our hearts just respond, Lord, with gratefulness and with thankfulness, God. Thank you for all that you've done and accomplished for us through the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Thank you, Pastor Patrick and team. There was a, just a weightiness to the worship, to the value of that. Thank you. That was special. 
What a gorgeous Colorado day, right? It, it, it makes me just find myself in a posture of gratitude and thankfulness, and, and especially because I remember exactly where I was exactly at this time last Good Friday. I was, I was standing right about there, somewhere smack dab in the middle, staring at a camera, and none of you were here, except like Jamie and Pastor Patrick. I think literally there were three of us, and, and it makes me so grateful that we get to be here, those of you in person and those of you joining us online together. And it makes it that much more great when we think about what we have to celebrate, the reason we have to celebrate. You know what, a, a bit more, because when I was driving here earlier in the day, I was kind of struck by something. A lot of you, I, I'm struck by gratitude for this church family. And we say it a lot of times like that, but I mean that. A family, people that are committed and love one another and give of ourselves. And, and especially on Holy Week, you have the opportunity as a pastor to receive a lot of well wishes and a lot of prayers and a lot of people texting saying, hey, big week, praying for you. And it made me kind of humbled in the sense of like, who am I? It's Jesus we're celebrating. Who, who am I that people are thinking about me, caring about me and praying for me? I'm, I'm grateful for it, and I'm grateful that people personally care. And beyond that, I kind of realized something, that we show up, you show up, those people that, that extended these prayers, they show up and, and they pray for someone like me, a pastor, because they're saying, as we gather as a church in person and online, I want to feel a movement of God. And that means I want to pray for the pastor. I want to pray that that's where he's at, that, that whatever God does, whatever God needs to say, or however God needs to move, I want to pray for my pastor because I want to know that God, if he's going to move, is going to do that in us and through us. And that's my prayer too. And so it made me incredibly thankful that, that we can not only pray for one another, love one another, but, but we long for people that are going to show up tonight and online, and maybe that you're going to share this service with, and certainly in the next couple of days for Easter Saturday and Easter Sunday, and we know we are desperate, and we want God to move, and that's what I'm praying for as well. I'm there with you, so let's get to it. Do you realize that there is a part of God, part of who God is, perfectly, righteously, in his perfection, very clearly spoken of throughout scripture, that you and I often neglect? Or if we were really honest, we actually wish it wasn't a part of God. We're kind of almost embarrassed. It's the wrath of God. We just sang about it. There was a line there. The wrath of God. Have you ever actually praised God for his wrath? <laughs> Have you ever sat there, thank you, God, thank you, praise you. You are a God of wrath. Probably not. But as with all the other attributes of God, if it's a part of who he is, it's a perfect and righteous part of who he eternally and faithfully is. But, but it can be something that you and I can tend to struggle with. Because when you and I try to relate or wrap our heads around the wrath of God, all we can come up with are imperfect examples of that, generally attributed to emotional outbursts or uncontrolled anger, right? That's wrath to us. That's the only wrath we really know. But of course, that's not God. A God that delights in sin or even just tolerates sin without any emotion, without any reaction, does not deserve to be worshipped. Because sin is hateful and destructive and worthy of being hated because of the pain that it causes and the destruction that it causes and even the irreverence. Maybe, just maybe, we can actually get a taste of this attribute of God, the wrath of God, when we feel disgust or hatred against great evil or injustice and sin. God just does that perfectly. To try to understand the basis for wrath, let's start biblically. Throughout the Old Testament period, God's righteous wrath was directed against all nations and people that rebelled against his sovereignty. Listen to Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take their counsel together against the Lord 
and his anointed. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. (laughs) That's chilling. That's not going on your coffee mug, I bet. God's wrath was also, though, directed at his own people, Israel, for the stubborn stubbornness that they had to live, for failure to live by the covenant which God had established with his chosen people. Exodus 32, and the Lord said to Moses, I have seen my people and behold, it is a stiff necked people. That means stubborn, rebellious. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them. And if you're like me, you might be bristling a little bit thinking that these passages, they must just be translated wrong, or I really hope other people don't hear these passages because it doesn't exactly paint God in a great light. Some of you are even going, please tell me, pastor, you're going to move on from this because I don't want my friends to hear what we're talking about. This isn't the kind of God that I want them to know. That's what I meant in the beginning when I said that there was a part of who God is perfectly clearly revealed to us that we honestly wish weren't that way. We wish he wasn't that way. We're kind of in a position of second guessing or judging his perfection there. And in the New Testament time, Paul addresses some similar warped thinking of the Jewish people at the time. They thought that they could escape the wrath of God by intending to do good. Their intentions, whether they actually did it or not, their intentions kept them from the wrath of God. Not God's standard of perfection as outlined in the law, their intentions. They thought, hey, at least we're trying. That's what really counts and keeps us from God's wrath like he has on those other people. And the Apostle Paul comes and goes, "Uh uh-uh. That's not the way it works, guys. Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And a few verses later, Romans 2, 5, because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Okay, I know you and I want to get to the good part as soon as possible, right? But in order to really accept God for all that he truly is, in order to really celebrate the cross and Good Friday, We need to know what we're saved from. And as much as I don't like it and you don't like it, God's wrath against waywardness, sin, is a righteous response to sin. Beyond scripture, our experiences may demonstrate a piece of God's wrath against the horror of at least some sin because of the pain and the damages that result. And say, a horrific act of hatred or mass murders, as we've lamented lately. A serviceman killed at the Capitol today. Pain and damage, acts of torture like crucifixion, rape. We're using such dramatic examples because they're magnified. And when we say it is right to be angry and affected and wrathful against those things, we can start to catch a glimpse of how our perfect God responds to sin. The perfect justice of God and the perfect ability to judge a situation, not just what happens, but the motives of people's hearts and the damage that's done on the offended. God perfectly judges any given situation without exaggeration, uncontrolled emotion, or blurry discernment. For God's perfect love and care for the victim of such brokenness and the wickedness and for his perfection and God's righteous justice, God's full wrath comes upon sin. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, 
and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Again, that's not a verse that you and I are likely to keep on the calendar or coffee mug. If a friend of yours were to share that verse on Facebook, I doubt that you and I would like it. (laughs) But whether we like it or not, even whether we agree with that or not, God's word to us shows us that he is perfect in his kindness, his faithfulness, his mercy, his love, and also his wrath. You can't remove that one. And that is why I rightly deserve judgment and wrath for my sin, my selfishness, me walking away from the will of God. And if God's wrath is what it is, let's say you're, you're convinced, I see it in scripture, there's no way around it, God's wrath is what it is, then there's a part of us that wants to redefine ourselves. <laughs> if we can't change God's wrath, we want to change ourselves. In light of all that we've talked about, if all of that is true, then we immediately want to lower the bar. (laughs) View God's standard of righteousness as unreasonable. Come on, God. I may not be perfect, but I'm not really that bad. And right there, we come in line, fall in line with generations and generations of people who second-guess God and his standard. Who say, God, you don't decide the standard. I can decide what's reasonable. You're going to grade me on a curve because I think that's what's right. Or we downplay the evil of our sin. Making the consequence of our sin somehow not damaging. And of course we do those things. Of course we do those things. Because we're desperate. We are desperate. We're terrified. We don't want the wall of God's righteous wrath on our left and the reality of our own sin and wickedness on our right to keep pressing in on us. It's too much of a weight to bear. And before you walk out of the room or or turn off the video on me, somewhere in the heaviness of all of this, we can be kind of confused. (laughs) Isn't church... And Christianity and following Jesus, a place that we have like warmth and welcome. (laughs) I'm not hearing that. I'm hearing judgment and wrath. And we're confused because we see that, okay, a perfectly righteous God will have wrath upon sin. And yet I also seem to recall when I open my Bible and I attend church and I talk to other believers that there's this God of love and warmth. Exodus 34, verses 6 through 7. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. Let's talk about that God. Slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression of sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. He's forgiving, he's loving, but by no means will he clear the guilty. How are we really to reconcile the righteous wrath of God with the overflowing aspects of his mercy? But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Hallelujah. The greatest news that there ever was. That is Good Friday. A righteously wrathful God, never ceasing in his perfection for a moment, never just letting one little exception slide by. Every single sin, your sin, my sin, every single one paid for in full. It just doesn't have to be paid by us. Never cheapen the cost that Jesus paid on the cross in becoming man in the Garden of Gethsemane and, of course, on the cross. A perfectly righteous and just God could never just pat sinners on the head and say, your sin really wasn't that bad that big of a deal. All of our hatred, rejection, rape, murder, apathy, no big deal. You're good. 
That is not a God that deserves to be worshipped. As an all-knowing, all-present God, perfectly righteous and spotless and flawless, he sees all of the offenses. Nahum 1-2, a book you may not be all that familiar with. The Lord is avenging and full of wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and reserves wrath for his enemies. That makes sense that an all-knowing, perfectly righteous God would punish rebellion. But here's where the really crazy thing happened. God not only sees and cares about what happens and the victims of sin, he also cares about the offenders, those committing the sin. God also has perfect love and care for the sinner, the offender, not just the offended. No matter the horrendousness of sin, this is not just forgiveness, this is grace. Because while a perfectly just and wrathful God can't look away from sin at all, he makes a way. And he turns to the sinner and says, there's grace still for you. Bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Shed on the cross. No matter the sin, you don't have to bear the wrath of God. The sweetness of the gospel, people, will only be good news when we understand the cost. As a, the Puritan preacher, maybe you've heard it before, Thomas Watson said, until sin is bitter, Christ will not be sweet. And I'm actually okay with, and I think the New Testament is okay with as well, if that's flipped around. Until Christ is sweet, sin won't be bitter. Our self-absorption, our sinfulness may only become apparent under the light of Jesus. That's why, by the way, as a church, we are going to preach Christ and the gospel at the forefront of our message to the outside world. That's what we want them to hear. Not primarily shining a light on the sin. Not primarily pointing out sin. That's what the law did and does. And I hope you're hearing me right. We're still going to be true to what is sin. Not condoning sin at all, but sin that is exposed by the comparative light of Jesus. God is delaying his final execution of his wrath upon evil for the purpose of leading people to repentance. Romans chapter 2 verse 4. God's kindness and patience is intended to lead people to repentance, to turning from their waywardness and towards him. This stirs the heart of the believer, if that's you, a follower of Jesus, towards praise and towards evangelism. You understand this, you grasp this, you have to tell other people, you can't help it. You've got to point the dark world of fallen people towards the light of Jesus. When you think about the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8, Jesus demonstrated forgiveness and grace for her deserved condemnation, caught in the act of adultery. And, and yet Jesus says, let he who has no sin cast the first stone. And all the religious leaders realize they can't do that, and they leave. And Jesus says to her, listen, is there no one left to condemn you? Neither do I. You're not condemned. And then he told her, go and sin no more. Change your life. Freedom, salvation first, life transformation second. Go and sin no more. People, let us celebrate and magnify and live lives of obedience to the beauty and the splendor of Jesus. He is worthy. His sacrifice is worthy of all of our praise. Like John the Baptist said, may we become less and less and less and Jesus in us and through us become more. Even on the night in which he was going to be betrayed, reclining in the presence of friends, who would soon surrender him, reject him, even while they were still offending. 
Our God took the bread that was there at the Passover celebration and he broke it saying, this is my body broken for you and for all people. And he took the cup that was there and he said, this is my blood shed, given, spent for you as the new covenant. The old covenant brought God's law, God's standard of perfection and man's wickedness together. It was necessary. It was not discarded or done away with at all. It was fulfilled in Jesus. And as the fulfiller, he then extends to us a new covenant. And it sounds like this. Romans 5, 8 through 9. But God chose his love for us in that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. <laughs> That's Good Friday. That's what we're celebrating. So those of you here in person, I invite you to take the cup that you received on the way in. If you didn't, if you have a handful of seconds here, there's a table right back there, about halfway back. You can grab one and invite you to share in this. Those of you joining us online, I invite you to take some bread and a cup and we will together remember his body broken for us. Let's take that bread together. I encourage you as we're doing this, we're not just having a snack in church. We are celebrating, commemorating, accepting the body of Christ broken upon that cross for you. You do not have to bear the wrath of God. His blood shed for you cleanses you and saves you. Let's remember that together. Those of you here in person, would you stand? Let's pour out our hearts in thankfulness and worship to him.
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His right, just less alone. Faultless stand before the throne. Amen. We're going to sing uh, nothing but the blood of Jesus, so please join in with us here. Let's sing this out. for being with us tonight. Have a good night and be blessed.